into our topical study. And actually what it is, is, is it is, but it isn't. You know, let's say we'll call it part two, but it's not really part two. It's uh, just another lesson. And what we're doing, we're calling this our playlist. If, uh, if you have a YouTube channel or you've ever seen this on a YouTube channel where you, we create multiple lessons about a specific topic. So we're doing topical studies about kind of the same topic, which is Easter. We've got a playlist we call it, you know, our, our Christmas study. And uh, we teach about why Christmas is uh, not Christian at all. You can see that on our YouTube channel. We're making one now. It's all about Easter. Uh, last time, last study, we did one called Passover, Pascha, and the uh, parenthetical note, which was Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. You can see that. Uh, this time, this week, uh, right now, we're going to go into religious traditions, eggs communicated. Uh, we call it eggs communicated, about you know, the Easter eggs and so forth, based on the word excommunicated. So religious traditions are going to be excommunicated or eggs communicated. And we're going to be cracking open, like you crack open an egg, we're going to be cracking open our Bibles. We're going to be cracking open a King James Bible on the topic of Easter. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, as our introductory verse. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, the Lord was uh, you know, having Paul tell the Colossians this. As he says, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, he even says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And that's what you find when you look at a lot of what's going on with what's so-called, whether it's St. Valentine's Day or Christmas or uh, Easter or everything, these are things that are not after Christ. These things don't follow who the Lord Jesus Christ is, what he's, what he's doing today in the dispensation of grace, concerning him being preached according to the revelation of the mystery, in the dispensation of grace. These are not what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. This is not who he is. And yet churches everywhere, uh, so-called churches, so-called denominations, so-called Christians are all about Christmas, Easter, uh, Valentine's Day, whatever you want to call it. They're all about these things that are not after Christ, the traditions of men. So we're going to go into a lot of these today so we can break down the pagan origins of them because these are the things you hear at this time of year. And so we'll go through these and we'll go over the uh, things that are meant to be helpful so that when you're in a group, you're in a family, you're in a crowd and you hear these topics come up, you can actually have some information, you can be armed with information uh, so that you can break down uh, the conversation and get the gospel out a little bit easier. This might help get the gospel out a little bit easier. And this is when you're talking with neighbors and friends and coworkers and family. And so we'll go through various topics that come up around this so-called Easter time. Uh, like we said, if you wanted to see the uh, origins of the only time you see the word Easter in the Bible, that would be the last study we did, uh, where we called it uh, Passover, Pascha, and the parenthetical note based on Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. I, I would highly suggest looking at that. The only time you find Easter in the Bible, Acts chapter 12, verse 4, I look at that study. We went in depth with that. Now we're going to look into more religious traditions and how they should be excommunicated, or what we call excommunicated, uh, based on what we're looking at here. So the first thing we'll do, we'll just kind of go down the list on our outline here, is uh, the topic of Lent. This is the, the time of season where you're going to hear this. Uh, it's going to come up quite a bit depending on the uh, religious crowd that you're around, maybe even a non-religious crowd that you're around. And so pretty much the word Lent, it actually is synonymous with the word spring. And of course, this is the time of uh, year that we're in. And it's derived from the old English word, uh, Lenten. And so it all comes from the uh, different word. And so and on this case, uh, all roads lead to Babylon on this. And it's, it, it comes from the 40-day spring fast that they were having back in the day. And uh, it even leads back to, if we look at Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, we're going to be actually turning to this chapter quite a bit um, and, and our, in our study today. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14, we'll be probably coming back to this very verse no less than three or four times. Well, actually, we'll start in verse 13, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13. And it says, he said also unto me, in Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13, he said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Talking about Israel. 
It says, then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And then he uh, said unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Uh, uh, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And so according to the, the uh, Mesopotamian Babylonian myth, um, uh, you, there was a, a great hunter who was slain while hunting for a wild boar. And um, uh, Tammuz was this great hunter. And uh, the devotees are, are mourning for Tammuz. You see this in verse uh, uh, 14, Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. And there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now we're going to come back to this verse. We're going to come back to this chapter because there's a lot more that has to do with this fable. There's a lot more that has to do with this religious um, story. And so you're just seeing the part here where they're weeping uh, for 40 days. They're going through their weeping ceremonies, their mourning ceremonies, where they're fasting and they give things up. And, and more in this more case than one, they're going through fasting ceremonies and weeping ceremonies over the fact that Tammuz died, this mighty hunter who was you know, slain by a boar. And then and, and in turn, you know, it's all about the boar, and it's all about the hunter. This, this religious myth, this religious tale. And so uh, we say that this is what Lenten, which is uh, synonymous with the word for spring, turns out being Lent. And of course, it's borrowed by uh, initially the Catholics, which gets turned into what you see for Lent, where they plug in what happened with the hunter fighting the boar and people weep over his death for 40 days. And it becomes a religious rite, a religious ceremony where people for 40 days uh, are mourning and weeping, not just for Tammuz, but then the, the um, Catholics turn it into the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not the Lord Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. It's the Catholic version, the Catholic narrative of, of who they would say the Catholic Christ. So... This is what we find in when it comes to the idea of Lent. This is why Lent is what it is now, based on the twisting and the uh, turning of this once uh, religious myth of a hunter who hunted a boar and the boar you know, kills the hunter and the hunter you know kills the boar, so on and so forth. All goes back to Lenten. So we see this here. And that's just the beginning. You're seeing this here in Colossians chapter two, verse eight. You know, concerning about the rudiments of uh, the world and the traditions of men, that's just one tradition of men, one man-made tradition, one religious tradition that gets plugged in this time. of, And so we see it's just as made up as everything you see concerning the mass of the Christ, which is also called Christmas. Everything gets taken and stolen and borrowed and plugged in all throughout the year. And you don't find it anywhere in your King James Bible. As a Bible believer, you look to believe what you find in the words of the page of this book, and you don't find it anywhere in December 25th. You don't find it anywhere in April. But you can find man-made myths. You can find man-made stories and fables all throughout uh, pages of history through people who never believed a thing about God. Uh, but yet it was plugged in by people who stole it, and we'll keep looking at some more. Uh, the next one is uh, you'll hear people say, well, did you get your ashes on Ash Wednesday? And so, you know, the sign of the cross, you know, rubbed with ashes, it's not exclusive to Constantinian uh, Christianity, which is the idea where Constantine was the one who was enforcing uh, the mandatory law that everyone had to become a Christian, but again, not the Christianity we are understanding today where you are literally believing what you read in the pages of your King James Bible. And you're, you're thankful for the cross and uh, you're rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, based on everything you read in 2 Timothy 3.16, all 66 uh, books of the Bible, and you're rightly dividing and growing and learning based on who God is. That's not what it is. It's where Constantine is saying, you're going to be the type of Christian I say you are. And you're going to be the type of Christian that is uh, associated with Roman Catholicism. And so it was exclusive to this Constantine type of quote-unquote Christianity. And it's found throughout the ancient world and was used as a prominent symbol of the ancient gods, ashes were. And so uh, the town cross, even the, the idea, it's not just the cross of Christ that you find in the pages of uh, 
your King James Bible, but crosses were used in general, whether it be the, it's spelled T-A-U, the Tau cross. Crosses were used in general for all sorts of different other purposes throughout history. And so that's used as, it was inscribed in the foreheads of the initiates to uh, the, the god of Mithras. Uh, that's another uh, thing you find throughout history. So Mithras was a false god and the initiates who wanted to worship Mithras had to put a cross on their forehead. And that was one type of thing. And it had nothing to do with Christ and him crucified, nothing at all. That was just a ritual that they did. And that was something that came up throughout history. Uh, the other thing was uh, they also did this in honor of Odin, who was the Norse pagan god, you know, the father of Thor. You're watching those, those uh, Marvel comic movies where the father of Thor is Odin. People who wanted to show him reverence and honor and over there uh, for the Norse god, they would put ashes on their forehead, not even in the sign of a cross. They would just take ashes, sprinkle it on their forehead. And that was supposed to show honor and reverence and respect to the Norse god Odin. And so this is something they did not only for Mithras, but they also did this in respect to Odin. And again, totally fake uh, gods that are not real. They're not in your King James Bible. They're not, they don't exist. But yet these were the rituals that were done that again, Catholicism came along and said, well, why don't we just copy that? Why don't we just do what they do and plug it into our religious system so that people can come along and start putting ashes on their forehead in the sign of a cross, just like people did when they worship Mithras, just like when people do when they worship Odin. And then they can copy, we can copy what they do. It's not even that they are saying, we'll learn from them and do it. Um, you know, different. We'll do. We'll let's do what we can find in the Bible. They're not even saying let's do what we can find in the Bible. They're saying let's not even look at the Bible. Let's just copy what they do. Let's just copy what unbelievers do. And so they're copying what Mithras worshippers are doing. They're copying what Odin worshippers are doing. And they're saying, well, let's just take the name of Jesus and throw it into these rituals, and then we'll just do what they do. And so when people talk about, did you get your ashes on Ash Wednesday, that goes back to Thor's father, or Odin, in Norse mythology. Just like when you read about Langton, and how this goes back to Tammuz, all these false, fake uh, gods out of different mythologies and folklore and fables, is what Roman Catholicism took and plugged into their rites and rituals. And so, so far, when it comes to Lent, when it comes to Ash and Ash Wednesday, has nothing to do with anything you find in the Bible. Now, you can't find people uh, who, who uh, put ash on their forehead and they dress in sackcloth. That's in your Bible, but that has to do with something completely unrelated to what you're reading about here in, um, you know, what's going on with the concept of what's, what's going on during these, these 40 days of Easter and Lent and so on and so forth. Uh, when, when people sinned in... Uh, Israel, and they were sorrowful for what they were doing, they would dress themselves in sackcloth, and they would pour ashes on their head uh, for a totally different reason. It wasn't a religious ritual to show God how great they are. It was to show them actually how sorrowful they were. And, and it wasn't to walk around uh, in their, their, their jobs or their malls or their towns and say, look at me, I have a cross of ash, uh, or, yeah, a cross of ash on my, on my head. It wasn't to display anything to be proud of. It was because they were so sorrowful that this was a way that they would repent, to use that phrase, to repent of their sins. This was Old Testament Israel days. So you can find the word ash in your King James Bible, and you can find it related to behavior, that this is what Israel, Old Testament Israel would do. So Ashes on Ash Wednesday, nothing that God talks about in the dispensation of grace today. It doesn't talk about believers needing to do this today. Uh, there's no purpose for putting ashes on your forehead today, but you do find it in mythology. You do find it with false gods. And so, again, this is something you find when it comes to Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 8. Uh, the tradition of men, philosophy and vain deceit, rudiments of the world, and things that are not after Christ. So this is why we're getting into these religious traditions. We're looking into them. We're cracking open the King James Bible on the things of Easter. So we're looking into this. And so these are just two things that we're finding so far. And as you keep going into it, you start looking into uh, more things. And, you're, and we're finding, as we look at these things, there's no cross. There's no 
death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ in a, as a fully sufficient payment for our sins, you don't find that. So far, we've looked at two religious traditions concerning uh, the cross and Easter. No cross involved. No death, burial, and resurrection involved. So we see that so far. As we go into the next one, you'll hear people say, well, during Palm Sunday last week, now we're looking at the third one, third tradition that comes up. During Palm Sunday last week, well, you know, we can turn into the Bible and read all about how Israel, Old Testament Israel, did use palms for uh, certain issues, for certain reasons. If you look at Leviticus chapter 23, in verse 40, you'll find it there. And it did have a purpose. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 40. This is what we find here. Talking about feast days, talking about things that people are to do, Israel was to do during their feast days. Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 40, it says, And ye shall take, take you on the first day of the boughs of the goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days, and ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in, in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are uh, is Israelites, well, that's who this is all, all these instructions are written for, are for Israelites, uh, born shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So the whole point of them you know, having the branches of palms in the first place was to be a reminder for Israel to understand and remember that the Lord did indeed bring them out of Egypt. Uh, so we see that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. That's one thing. That's one point of why there's a Palm Sunday in the first place. Again, that's not why uh, it should be existing in this dispensation of grace today. But this is why it was happening back in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. It was for Israel to have a reminder that, that God brought them uh, out of uh, Egypt. And that's Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40. Even if we see, we'll see it again, even in the ages to come, even when they're rescued again. If you look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. Revelation chapter uh, 7, verse 9, you see how it talks about, here's the tribe of Judah, here's the tribe of Simeon, here's the tribe of Zebulun, here's all these different tribes that are there. Verse 9 says, and this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palms in their hands. Again, this is something this is uh, taking place. It says, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation unto uh, our, to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and uh, unto uh, the Lamb. And so this is something that they're saying, that they're exclaiming here, but they have palms in their hands. This is, again, a reminder. This is a, uh, Most likely these are a great crowd, uh, but they're all part of the little flock of Israel who are, are thankful and, and are reminded that God did indeed, in their history, bring them out of Egypt. They have palms in their hands. They should. And so especially if they're part of the tribes that you read about all throughout the first couple of verses in uh, Revelation chapter 7. So we see this here. And then as we kind of uh, keep reading through Palm Sunday, it's a Jewish custom regarding Israel and prophecy. When you read this in Leviticus 23, uh, nobody knew what this, you know, what this meant. If we look at John chapter 12, verse 13. In John, the book of John, Old Testament book of John, chapter 12, verse 13. As they're doing this, as they're following through with Leviticus chapter 23 and the book of John, chapter 12, verse 13. Actually, we'll go in, uh, John chapter 12, verse 12 says, uh, on the next day, much people that uh, were come to the feast uh, 
that were come to the feast, uh, when they had heard uh, that Jesus was come to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So as we're seeing here, this is something, again, they're thankful, uh, again, for the history of what God had done for them, uh, bringing them out of Egypt. But they're not saying that oh, they're so thankful that God died on the cross and paid for their sins. This is, they have no knowledge of this in John chapter 12, based on Leviticus chapter 23. This, these are uh, Jews in prophecy. Christ hasn't died on the cross yet in John chapter 12. They're saying, blessed is the king of Israel, which is who he should be. And uh, he's supposed to do everything that they know him to do in Revelation chapter 19, 11, vanquish his enemies, based on Isaiah chapter 63, uh, destroy his enemies. Uh, that cometh in the name of the Lord. You can see more about it in Psalm 72 and then so on. It just goes on. And so this is uh, what we, they're saying is, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. Uh, so this is what they talk about. Again, no cross, no death, burial, and resurrection as payment as a sufficient payment for their sins. It's not known in John chapter 12. It's not known in Leviticus 23. Um, and this is something that you see here in context when it comes to uh, the idea of them having palms in their hands. So when people talk about you know, Palm Sunday, I went to the Palm Sunday uh, service at the church. I went to, uh, you know, I, I took a, a, a palm and folded it into a cross. Well, nobody was doing that in Leviticus 23. Nobody was doing that in John chapter 12. Nobody had a reason to do that. Nobody knew about the cross in John chapter 12. So they had no idea what Christ and him crucified meant. But they did understand the, uh, the events of prophecy and that this was supposed to be the king, their Messiah, who was going to set up the kingdom. This is what they you know, believed it was going to be. He was supposed to set up the kingdom on earth. They knew that much, but no cross, no death, burial, and resurrection. So, so we see that so far when it comes to Lent, when it comes to Ash and Ash Wednesday and Palm Sunday and Palms in general, there's no, there's no cross yet. There's no, or in some cases, there won't be a cross. There's no death, burial, and resurrection. There's no payment for sin. And it's not in these uh, you know, religious traditions as we're breaking it down and taking a look at it. So, And as we go into our next religious tradition, as we keep going down the list, you'll see it says, uh, you'll hear this phrase come up when you're at different family events or you're with different friends or talking to maybe different coworkers, whatever it may be the situation that you come across during this time of year where there's this Easter concept going on. I says, we know that people say, I went to church, I went to mass, I went to the, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is, uh, for Friday, on Good Friday. And so usually the intent is for you to participate in a sorrowful observance of uh, the death of Christ. And you focus on what it means for you. So the death of Christ is something that you, you're supposed to you say, well, Christ had a bad day, and I can think of all the bad days I've had in life, and he had a bad day, I had a bad day, so I'm going to just sit back and think about it. And, you know, uh, you know, all the bad days must mean that, you know, when I have a good day, it must mean, and you just start to you know, zone out in your own personal thoughts. Again, no cross, no death, burial, and resurrection, or if you do think about the cross, it's not talking about the gospel. If you look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul tells us exactly what to think about the cross. Galatians chapter 6, verse uh, 14. It's usually Good Friday for religious people and religious purposes is the day for sorrowful reflection, fasting, and mourning over the death of Christ. But that's completely contrary to glorying in the cross of Christ, which is what Paul says here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, where he says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in uh, Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So he goes forth and he's, and he's saying how, how great the cross is. And this is and he's saying, for as many as walk according to this world, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. And so he goes forth and he explains this there. So he's going for, especially Galatians chapter 6 is great that you know, explains all this. But it's really Galatians chapter uh, 6, verse 14 and 15 that explain the glory of the cross. And it's saying there, you know, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. So if you're going to glory in something, you're going to glory in that cross. You're going to be thankful for that cross. You're going to be uh, just, just joyous in the fact that Christ has died on the cross to pay for it. And you're going to glory in that. 
And yet religion would have you be uh, ashamed and sorrowful that, you know, that God had to go and die on the cross and pay for your sins. It's the opposite. You're thankful that Christ went and died on you. It's, it's, hey, it's either him or you, and it was him. So you, you're going to be thankful that somebody went and died on the cross and paid for years. So you've got to sacrifice. Uh, you've got someone who actually went and went and, and uh, went to the cross for you. That's a great thing. Your sins are paid for now. And that's across the board. So you can't find another human being on the face of the earth that says, well, I don't need that. Everybody needs that. You can't find a human being that doesn't need that. Period. Anyway. So everybody needs that. Everybody who will be born needs that. Everybody that was already born needs that so across the board galatians 6 14 is great because first corinthians 15 1 through 4 is great it's great news and yet religion would have you say you need to be sorry you need to be mourning you need to be ashamed you need to be feeling terrible about jesus going to the cross well, no i'm not gonna feel terrible at all so this this time where you need to reflect and feel sorry and feel bad and feel ashamed not gonna happen Paul tells me to feel differently about it. Paul tells me to understand things differently. He says, look at uh, Colossians, Colossians uh, chapter 3. How to think, how to set your affections, how to feel about certain things. Paul tells in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, If ye then be risen with Christ, which we are once we trust the gospel, we are, uh, we've died with Christ, we're buried with Christ and we're risen with Christ according to the mind of God. Seek those things which are above, uh, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, your identity, your purpose, your walk, your Lord, your God, your Savior. Uh, not on things on the earth. Things on the earth would tell you things like uh, religious things, religious doctrines, religious purposes. Don't set your affections on religious doctrines or religious purposes that say you need to be ashamed of the cross of Christ. You need to be ashamed of what Jesus did for you. You need to be ashamed of having somebody needing to go to the cross for you. Actually, you can be thankful and uh, grateful and uh, you know, feeling great that, that Jesus, your Lord, our Lord, our God, went to the cross and paid for our sins. And that's why we study him more. We learn about him more. We, under, we, we gain more knowledge about who he is and what he's done. We trust his gospel, his gospel of grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, we learn more about that. Uh, religion would tell you differently. We're not religious. We're not here to be religious. And so that's what we read about when it talks about, and then they tell you, you need to fast, you need to reflect, you need to mourn over the death of Jesus. But that's completely contrary to Galatians and Colossians and Ephesians and Romans and Paul in general, what, of why God sent Paul out to the world to explain this revelation of the mystery of Christ. So we see that there. So the annual religious, you know, recreation of a week of ignorance of the cross is not what we want. And, you know, it's darkness and the sorrowful mourning uh, has worked to undermine the grace ministry of reconciliation. And so we want to be rejoicing in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, not being ignorant of what it means. And so the gospel of the grace of God doesn't end with the death, burial, and resurrection. It begins with it. And then it goes out from there from God to Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus becomes the Apostle Paul. Paul writes his letters. We study his letters. We, in turn, at some point, trust the gospel as someone explains it to us, or we study the letters. We learn and grow. We become members of the body of Christ. We grow in our understanding. We pass it on to other people, and the cycle continues. So the gospel of the grace of God doesn't end with the death, burial, and resurrection. It begins there. Our gospel of Christ should never be hidden darkness. Uh, behind symbols or expressed in religious rituals. We don't need that. That's not what it's here for. So we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And if you're watching this for the first time, don't forget to subscribe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. We know that for religion, as they watch this, they may say, well, you know, this is quite this is a new take on the cross. This is a new understanding for us. We'd rather mourn and feel sorry, and we'd rather, you know, um, hide from the glory. We don't want to glory in the cross. We want to pay for our sins ourselves. First Corinthians 118 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but the 
unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The gospel that Christ has died and paid for our sins is the power of God itself to pay for sin, to pay for the penalty of all of our sins once and for all, past, present, and future, is the power of God. That's what the gospel is. We can glory in that, Galatians 6.14 and 6.15. We can rejoice in that and glory in that and understand the power of God to pay for sins, to take people who were are once rejoicing in sin and understand that we can be transformed and rejoice in the power of God, rejoice in the gospel, rejoice in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and continue uh, to operate from there as members of his body. Um, and so we see that there. Uh, we don't just rejoice in one week uh, of, of this. We rejoice in this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We rejoice every day in the glory of the cross. So we see that there. So that's something that we want to you know, see and take a look at. But this next uh, topic, this next religious tradition is very interesting to take a look at. And it's going to be talking about Easter eggs and the Easter egg hunt and the Easter bunny. It's a bit of a switch of a topic, but it's still very interesting because, uh, again, nothing biblical or Christian about it. But if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 6. Deuteronomy 22, verse 6. People sometimes they say, well, what does the Bible have to say about Easter eggs? What does the Bible have to say about eggs? Or what does the Bible have to say about Easter egg hunts or Easter eggs in general? Or, or I'm going to go on a concordance and look up what the Bible has to say about Easter eggs or whatever it may be. And they'll look up the word eggs and they'll find a couple of uh, verses. One of them they're eventually going to bump into if they look up the word eggs. They'll see Deuteronomy 22, verse 6, which says, If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, uh, and the uh, dam sitting up, upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young, but thou shalt uh, in any wise let the dam go. And take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest prolong thy days. So under Levitical law, if you went on an Easter egg hunt, if you went on an egg hunt of any type, it's saying here, if you see a bird's nest in your way, and you have, uh, and you look and you see them, if you see that the bird's nest has fallen to the ground, and there's eggs in that nest, and you go and you touch it, and you're messing around with life in general, wildlife in general, and you're messing around with eggs and, and birds and everything else, under the Levitical law of Moses, just one of the 613 points of law, and all of them apply to uh, what God set up for Israel, you're breaking the law by touching an egg. And so today when people say, well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm part of Israel, I'm spiritual Israel, I'm replacement Israel, I'm some type of Israel, at their different churches or at their different religions or at their different whatever it is. They think they're Israel, but then they go on an Easter egg hunt, not knowing that Deuteronomy 22.6 says you're not touching any eggs. If you touch any eggs of any type, especially ones that fall on the ground, uh, you know, you're, you're looking for trouble. As it says there, you're, you, you'd want to prolong your life by not touching you know, the eggs that fall out of a nest. So we see this here in uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 6. Uh, nothing Christian about it, nothing biblical about it, nothing concerning the cross is about this. But uh, we see this here. And it goes on, you, you can see more about this in Leviticus 22, 28, Proverbs 12, 10. And uh, if you look even at Psalm 104, verse uh, 10. Uh, Psalm 104, verse 10. You see why this law was created in the first place because there's a lot of laws and those 613 points of law you say why is that law there and why is that law there psalm 104 verse 10 kind of sheds a little more light on this because kind of while we're parked here for a minute psalm 104 verse 10 just says that uh, he sendeth yeah he sendeth the springs into the valleys which run among the hills they give drink to every beast of the field the wild asses quench their thirst by them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. And so you're seeing that it's all about the, you know God showing um, you know, 
love or courtesy, whatever you want to call it. He's, he's, it's his creation that he's, you know, as you see in verse 12, by them shall the fowls of the heaven have their habitation, which sing among the branches. It's just showing that he's having respect for the animals or he's, he's loving the animals. He's you know, reaching to his creation, you know, including the humans and the animals and uh, the wild asses and, and so on and so forth. And if you remember the verse, even in, I think it's Matthew, uh, let me see if it's Matthew, if it's, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's Luke 12, 24. Kind of a famous verse. You've, we've all read it before. Luke 12, 24. When he was teaching this to the little flock of Israel. And he says, consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? So it's not just to focus on, you know, birds and eggs and so on, but that was why that law was there saying, you know, don't mess with the wildlife. Don't hurt them. Don't, don't be mean to them or bad to them. God, you know, loves, you know, uh, beasts of the field and fowls of the air. And, and it's all his creation, essentially, is where the theme of where this is supposed to be going. Uh, so to go forth and to, uh, you know, go hunting down eggs just for sport, uh, some, Moses wouldn't be around doing this, you know, just to go, Let's go find some eggs and, and paint them and, and bash them and beat them and catch them. And, and you know, Moses isn't going to go around doing this. And most people think they're spiritual Israel. So uh, this is not something you're going to find in the Bible. Another thing, too, you may say, well, that's just the Easter egg and or the Easter egg hunt. Uh, so if we look also at Leviticus chapter 11, verse 6. Uh, Leviticus 11, verse 6, there's going to be another familiar animal we're going to find here. Especially Leviticus 11. We've got a lot of animals in Leviticus chapter 11. But Leviticus 11, 6, especially. What you find here says, you know, when you go through the King James Concordance and you try to find the word bunny, not there. You look for rabbit, it's not there. The next synonymous word you're going to find with bunny and rabbit is going to be hare, H-A-R-E. You find this in Leviticus 11, uh, verse 6. It says, And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. So you're going to find that uh, Israel, uh, spiritual Israel, replacement Israel, literal, they're not touching any rabbits. And they're not going after any eggs either. They're not hunting for eggs nor touching any rabbits. And yet you're going to find churches in your town are going to say, well, let's go, uh, you know, let's go see the Easter bunny and go hunt down some eggs. Uh, well, Israel is not going to be doing that. And of course, we're not Israel. We're the body of Christ. We're not in Old Testament times. We're not we're not them and they're not us. As we rightly divide the word of truth and take some spiritual lessons out of it. We're just seeing that this is all completely unbiblical as far as uh, what what's going on in uh, you know, when the church has the Easter egg hunt, when the church wants to have the Easter bunny come to town. And when a church wants to, when a church wants to do something like this, then you're finding it's not even matching up with what's in the Bible. So you're finding that they're way off course when they're trying to do this. So, but this pagan celebration of everything that's going on, and pretty much this goes back to what we had studied last time when we were going through Passover, Pascha, and the parenthetical note from Acts chapter 12, verse 4. We had said that it was all about the goddess of Estra, that King Herod was worshiping. And that he, uh, that Estra, that goddess, had healed a, um, a bird and turned it into a rabbit. And since the bird lays eggs, uh, and, and uh, this Estra, which was later turned, called Easter, uh, turned the bird into a rabbit. The rabbit started laying eggs. That was the fable. That was the religious tale that was told. Later Christianized, quote unquote, by the Catholics. Uh, this was, you know, uh, what we went over last week. If you want to see more about that, you can watch uh, last week's uh, study. But this is more so where you're getting the Easter egg, the Easter hunt, the Easter egg hunt, the Easter rabbit, the Easter bunny, all this other stuff. And you're finding how it's far from what the Bible has to talk about. So, but it's all, you know, again, going back to what we're going through today, you know, religious traditions and how we're excommunicating them. So they're getting rid of them. But uh, none, and again, Nothing about the cross of Christ in any of this. Nothing about the death, burial, and resurrection. Nothing about the gospel. Nothing about how we're saved from the penalty of our sins and how we're saved by Christ's shed blood. Nothing in it. So as we break that down, we're finding out more. So when we get to, again, moving on into the next thing, 
uh, the, the idea of jelly beans. Not much to talk about there. Uh, nothing biblical or Christian about them. It, was, it started getting used in the 1930s and possibly because of their egg shape. But most candy historians, as they kept, kind of took a look at them, they were being used or originated in the Middle East as sort of a Turkish uh, delight. Uh, it's been around for centuries. Um, the soft chewy center is um, you know, mostly you know, Turkish delight. And then it came about mostly in the 17th century. And uh, again, nothing to do with it. No, no cross, no death, burial, and resurrection. Nothing, nothing about it that has to do with Bible or anything like that. But uh, so we'll move on to our next one. It's kind of short and simple. But if you look at John chapter 20, verse 1. The book of John, chapter 20, verse 1, we're going to get to our next one. And the first thing that, uh, or the next thing that you're going to hear around this time, around this season of uh, quote-unquote Easter, with John, chapter 20, verse 1, is going to be was, sunrise service was beautiful today. And they're going to say, well, sunrise service was so amazing. But you'll see in John, chapter 20, verse 1, it says, the first day of the week, cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and see the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So why is there a sunrise service if Mary Magdalene shows up while it was yet dark? Sun's not even up yet. It's still dark and the stone's already taken away. Jesus has already risen while it was yet dark. Sun's not even up yet. So where's the sun? Why is there a sunrise service? People want to show up right at the tip of sunrise to have a service, but Jesus has risen while it was still dark. Where's the sunrise coming from in all this? That's John chapter 20, verse 1. That shows this. And so, again, this goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning of this study. We're going back to our chapter Ezekiel, chapter 8, verse 14. Going back to that again. And we'll probably again revisit this and yet. Uh, a third time. Uh, Ezekiel, or it's coming back to our, uh, our old friend Tammuz. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 14. This is yet another pagan practice where Ezekiel saw them involved in a rite where they were mourning the death of the Mesopotam uh, Mesopotamian Babylonian god, it was Tammuz, uh, whose, whose myth said he would be resurrected into new life which is you know, a mockery of redeeming death and life-giving resurrection of the true Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. But it revealed that uh, this, the paganism affected the, uh, the, the women of uh, Israel at that time. And so we see here it says in verse 14, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, we read this earlier, who was toward the uh, north, and behold, there sat women weeping for it. Tammuz, we read that earlier. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and I will, sh uh, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And it says, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. And he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have to return to provoke me to anger. And though they put the branch to their nose. So you see in verse 16, it's saying that they, uh, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun. So if you want to see where sunrise service is coming from, again, we're, we're going to see everything here in Ezekiel chapter 8, they're worshiping the sun. We're seeing Israel, who's supposed to be worshiping the Lord, is worshiping the S-U-N, not the S-O-N. And so they're worshiping the actual planet, or, you know, what do you want to call it? Uh, they're worshiping the sun, S-U-N. And so when sunrise service comes about, John chapter 20, verse 1 already says, when it was dark, the Lord had risen. So there's no need for any sunrise service, but Israel is partaking in sunrise services because they're looking to worship the sun as soon as it gets up. And they worship the sun like it's a god. As they weep, the women weep for Tammuz, who was that hunter killed by a boar and, and so on and so forth. And so this is what you see here when, when they talk about sunrise service. It was borrowed 
from paganism. It was borrowed from false gods and false rituals and false rites that had nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ rising at sunrise. But people will say, oh, it was the Lord rising at sunrise. No, it wasn't. John chapter 20 says he rose before the sun came up. And now you're seeing uh, unbelieving Israel worshiping the sun itself. And that's where the Catholics took it from and plugged it into everything that is so-called Christian. And it's not. So we see that there. And again, nothing to do with the cross. Again, if you're liking what you're hearing so far, make sure you subscribe. Uh, just to throw that out again, subscribe to the channel. Make sure you check out more of our videos and see what we're doing here. Uh, as we move on to the next one, as we're getting close to wrapping up, uh, this will be our last one. Uh, you'll hear them say quite a bit, and again, we're just going to stay here in Ezekiel chapter 8, because again, we're going, we're still sticking with Ezekiel chapter 8. This brings up quite a bit. We've, so far, we've looked at the hunter, we've looked at the worshiping of the sun, all through Ezekiel chapter 8, but you're going to hear, if you go to, you, you go to the family's house, you go to the neighbor's house, you go to your friend's house, you go, you bring, you bring some food to work, and you're going to hear, well, I'd like some of that Easter ham, please. Yeah, you know, where's the ham coming from? Well, again, it's all coming back to what we're talking about when it comes to Tammuz here in Ezekiel chapter 8. There sat women weeping for Tammuz. Remember, Tammuz was the one who was hunting that boar. And the boar was, you know, the pig. The pig was ham. And so in celebration of the historical fable, the historical religious tale of the hunter who was killed by a boar, well, you get to eat that boar. You get to eat that pig on Easter Sunday because the hunter... It was the one who you know goes and and you know uh, kills the boar and the boar kills the hunter and so on and so forth. People are uh, you've got people weeping for the hunter. The, the women are weeping for Tammuz in Ezekiel eight fourteen, and then he you know kills the uh, you get you get to kill the boar and you get to eat the pig every day on so called Easter, which is not anything to do with Christianity. It all goes back to this tale in Ezekiel chapter eight. So you see that there. And people and these idolatrous Jewish women were crying for 40 days. Again, as we said earlier, that created light. They were crying for Tammuz for 40 days and 40 nights. That was their ritual. So, and we remember how meat doctrines work. And I'll just throw out the verses. If you remember Romans chapter 14, verse 20, you know, the weaker brother is worried about meat versus the stronger brother that's not worried about meat. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8 through uh, 13, and Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, all those meat doctrines um, you can read about uh, in the dispensation of grace concerning the body of Christ that, you know, whether you do or you don't eat meat, that's not what the issue is. It's the focus of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So uh, we see that there. And so if anything, it's, it's that uh, people say that Easter has been hijacked by the unbelievers and by the pagans. And it's actually the other way around. It's what belonged to the pagans were hijacked by fake Christians, by Catholics. And so the pagans should be pointing fingers at the Catholics saying, hey, why'd you take over our pagan rituals? It's actually the other way around. And so if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, verse 15, we'll start to wrap things up here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. It should be... The pagans pointing at the Catholics saying, why did you take over our rituals for? We were doing so well with them. Why did you have to Christian, uh, you know, throw your version of Christ into it? You know, Christianize it, if you want to say it like that. 1 Corinthians uh, 6, verse 15 says, uh, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall uh, be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We see in verse 19, What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 20. It says, uh, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. You've seen this all throughout these different uh, religious traditions today. 
It says, but I say that the things with the gent which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You can't have it both ways. The religions, religions love symbols because it provides them something tangible to identify their faith. Faith is a mystery to religion. Uh, confusing and undefined. You know, symbols and relics and traditions is what uh, gives definition to their faith. Uh, their pillar and ground of the truth lies in the continuous traditions and symbols protected by their church. Without these symbols, their faith would become vague and unreal and uh, without participation. Or we, on the other hand, we don't need symbols. We don't need uh, you know, all these different things. We don't need relics or symbols or traditions to define our faith. We have faith in what actually took place, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which we have perfectly preserved in our King James Bible, rightly divided, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. We have the perfectly preserved words of God that we can study, learn, grow, and understand, and we have them right here. So we don't need religious traditions, which is why we're excommunicating them, or excommunicating them today, as we crack open the King James Bible on the concepts of Easter. So with that, we're going to stop here. We hope that added to our previous study, which is what we did from last time, which was the Passover, Pascha, and the parenthetical note from Acts chapter 12, kind of a side, you know, kind of a side-by-side -side study. We might even look into a third study just to add this to our Easter playlist. And uh, again, if you're looking, if you like what you're hearing, subscribe to the channel and uh, see if there's any kind of thoughts, questions, or comments on what we just went over today. See if this helps. Uh, hopefully this was a benefit for you. Hopefully this worked out well and added more to your understanding about the concept of Easter. And uh, if there's any thoughts or comments or questions, uh, feel free to ask you know, at this time. Mm -hmm. It's clean. Okay. Yeah. Liked it? Help Just remember that. Like like on Sunday, right? Yeah. They saved that one for the next year. Yeah. For this one. Yeah, yeah that's true. They collect the old mm -hmm. palms. Yeah, the old palms yeah. become the ashes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no reason for mm -hmm. it. Pagan. Yeah, it's all pagan, as you saw from our study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the interesting part is is when you got a palm on Palm Sunday from church. Yeah. It was holy. And so you had to treat it with respect. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, what a joke. Yeah. 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 And again, that's that's what like, identifies like the that, religious faith. Like the Easter, the Easter, you know, that sunrise. Is, you know the one that sunrise service mm -hmm. and, and, and Christ rose before the sunrise. Yeah. So there's no need for it. It's all about so the worshiping. Could I eat that one Catholic? Yeah, Wait. remember remember we just went through Ezekiel chapter 8? Was yeah. that they were all worshiping the sun. They mm. were worshiping the planet of the sun yeah. instead of God. So then they borrowed that and they threw that in and said, well, let's just continue to worship the sun, the sunshine. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing. But people don't even know. Yeah. But not even Catholics celebrate that anyway. Well, they do. Baptists, yeah. Well, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, only that. yeah, yeah, Baptists, all sorts yeah. of different Christian mm -hmm. circles and Christian denominations and Christian mm -hmm. people don't even know why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. They think they're doing it because Jesus rose from the grave at sunrise. Yeah. But before dark, he was already up. So when they go, just missed him. Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty much. Yeah. Following that train of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Right. See, so, yeah, and, and it, it explains a lot more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah, well, uh, See about if there's no other other thoughts or questions or comments, we'll uh, kind of wrap up here. And uh, yeah, if there's no other thing, we'll uh, we'll wrap up here, and then we'll be back on. Let's see, today's Wednesday. We'll be back here on Sunday for another study, and uh, it may or may not be about Easter. We'll kind of continue down our playlist of making uh, more studies on Easter. But yeah, we'll wrap up here and we'll kind of continue from there. So yeah, yeah. So if anything, if you liked what you saw, click like and subscribe. And uh, we'll be back here on Sunday for another study. Mm -hmm.
So uh, thank you for everyone that joined us. And we look forward to having everyone uh, come back again on uh, Sunday for another study. Everyone, thanks for, thanks for joining. And we'll be back here again. Bye, everybody. See everyone later.